Good afternoon, ladies and gents, and uh, welcome to our live webinar. My name is Anthony. Uh, this is our live webinar called The Five Best Practices of Service Recovery, The Science of Service Recovery for CX Professionals. Uh, like I said, my name is Anthony. I head up product marketing at Incuba, and I am joined by Margot, director at uh, Incuba Australia. Margot, do you want to say hi quick? Yes. Hi, Anthony. Thanks for the intro, um, and welcome everyone to our webinar today. Great. All right. A uh, little bit of housekeeping before we before we kick off. Um, just a view of the agenda so that you all know what to expect. I'm going to uh, take you through a presentation called the five best practices of service recovery. Um, that's going to probably take 10 or 15 minutes. And then then what I'll do is we'll uh, pause for a poll because we really want uh, your view on something. I'm going to ask you guys a question just to participate in something. Um, at that point, I'm going to hand over to Margot, who's going to uh, do a demonstration for us and then towards the end uh, we will have an opportunity for Q&A. So on that you will note that in your little uh, webinar widget there is a questions section. If uh, you want to submit any questions during the course of the webinar please feel free to do that and uh, we'll try hard to address all of them uh, towards the end. Um, and then obviously um, you would have seen in some of the communication that one of the reasons, uh, sorry, one of the things that we have uh, for you today is this paper called The Five Best Practices of Service Recovery. Today's webinar is really a summary of this paper, and I will give you some information in a moment in terms of, uh, in terms of how to access this. This is a far more in-depth uh, uh, bit of thought leadership on the five best practices. Uh, but we're going to jump straight in now, and let me kick off with something called the Service Recovery Paradox. The service recovery paradox, uh, something quite interesting, and many of you may have already read about this. It may be best explained in a story. So let's, uh, let's tell a little story about our business traveler. Let's call her Sophie for the purposes of the story. And it's about our business traveler who has her flight canceled and she is form informed by automated text message. Uh, before she's able to make a call to the airline to complain about this, Someone actually reached, someone from the airline actually reaches out to her, contacts her personally, and offers her a flight for the same day, as well as an airport shuttle on her arrival. This makes her happy because she doesn't need to wait an extra day or an extra couple of days. And something that happens is that, is that actually her customer satisfaction or her loyalty increases to a level that it uh, increases to a level that is higher than it was. Uh, prior to the service failure, which is an interesting dynamic. And that's why it's called the service recovery paradox. And I'll show you what that looks like in a, on a chart in a moment. The, the other important thing that I'm going to get to in, in a couple of minutes is that at a high level, this looks like quite a basic um, scenario in terms of the service failure, the service recovery and how it played out. But there was actually an incredible amount of uh, of logic and rules sitting in the background that that resulted in the customer being ha having her ticket assigned to a very particular agent, the agent then offering something which was very specific um, to her and how that all played out. And we'll tell you exactly how that played out um, in a moment. We'll actually come back to this little this little case study. But back to the service recovery paradox. Um, here's a quick chart. The blue line, the blue S curve, uh, represents what what most uh, customer service scenarios would look like if there was no service failure. So this would be the normal one. This is obviously an aggregate. There'd be a little lift in the middle. As you become more accustomed with the brand, you're more sure of the fact that you are, should be actually with that brand. But then service failure, if you look at the red, the red curve, the service failure would have that dip. Then effective service recovery would result in the increase. And this is based on a study. Uh, you can see the, little, the source there at the bottom, um, if any of you want to Google that. And um, it would actually result in the customer satisfaction or customer loyalty increasing to, an, um, to a level that is actually higher than it was prior to the service failure. So this is an interesting dynamic because what this really means is that service failure offers an opportunity to boost loyalty. The obvious next question is, surely not all service recoveries are equal. There is service recovery and there is service recovery, and that is true. And that's really the reason for this webinar, because we're going to be taking you through uh, best practices of what uh, 
really great service recovery looks like so that you're not just trying to recover and scramble to get back to exactly where you were, but you're also trying to boost the loyalty of your customer base for those people who are affected by service failures. And that is what we're going to be taking you through today. So that is the, the introduction. And that introduces the five best practices. But before we jump into that, for those of you who are not that familiar with us, I just want to take one minute to introduce who we are. Uh, uh, Incuba has offices in Australia, Southern Africa, and North America. Uh, our client base, I'm just going to open this up quickly, uh, looks something like this. You can see that uh, we play quite a lot in the financial services and insurance space, FSI. We also uh, have some visibility in telcos, hospitality and lifestyle, as well as retail. And happily, we've enjoyed some recognition recently from, uh, from Forrester and Gartner in some of their reports. Uh, most recently, uh, November 2018, where Incuba was one of only two providers globally uh, to provide, sorry, to receive top ratings in three out of four categories, which is great. So we're going to get back to one, two, three, four, and five now in terms of our best practices, and we're going to jump straight in at a high level. Uh, those five best practices are the following. First of all, capturing everything. Your customers are giving you feedback all the time. They're talking all the time. And it's important that those voices, the voice of your customer, are uh, brought into the business and distributed so that there is visibility uh, in all the right places. You then need to explore the context. So every customer comes with some context. They come with baggage, if you like. And uh, that context is important before we reach out to them or pick up the phone because it may inform the way that we actually want to address it. We then drive recovery. Um, this comes through um, basically the culture within the business and how we achieve that. Uh, humans like to deal with humans, and that's why we want to be human. But obviously, when we are dealing with large volumes of, of customers, we need uh, mechanisms, I suppose, or approaches to offer, offer empathy at scale. And that's what that's all about. And then towards the end, there are some things to, that we can do or ensure uh, to make sure that our frontline staff and those who are dealing with customers on a day-to-day -day basis are able to be efficient. Right, so we're going to jump straight into number one, capturing everything. Your customers are providing feedback all the time through a number of uh, channels, and these channels are formal and informal, and it's essential that we are capturing and sharing everything. So let's just talk about the capturing and the sharing quickly. Um, irrespective of channel, your customers are saying things out there. Sometimes they're saying it to each other, Sometimes they are directing it at the business, but we, we need to make sure that all of that is captured. So structured mechanisms would be things like surveys. Unstructured would be the social web, for instance, where there is chatter, uh, but your brand is being mentioned. It's very important that that is all being brought uh, into the business and is then being distributed uh, depending on the context. And when I say context, I mean uh, who the customers are and what it is that they are talking about, because not everything is important to everyone within the business. We want to make sure that feedback is arriving in front of the right people. It's likely that you are receiving quite a high volume of, uh, of feedback, and not everything is important to the point that you want to create a ticket about it, especially on the social web, but you want to be, be creating tickets or cases, we call them cases, and we want to create them systematically because otherwise it leaves the responsibility up to someone within the business to try and discern what's important and what's not. Um, and we can really solve a lot of these problems just by creating cases systematically. So we do this based on rules. We say that whenever feedback comes into the, into the business, you should be able to uh, create cases based upon rules. So what are some of these rules or these systematic, um, these systematic rules uh, that we would suggest or creating of cases. Well, let's let's look at a couple suggestions. Quantitative and qualitative feedback. So I've I've already mentioned a survey example. You may want to set up a rule that says every time someone uh, receives a survey and gives us an NPS rating which is lower than seven, for instance, or eight, uh, let's create a ticket and assign it to that part of the business. That way, there's visibility in real time. Themes and sentiment. So. Uh, through text analytics, whenever there is verbatim inf information coming back at you, so open-ended feedback, unstructured feedback, we want to be able to text analyze that feedback and uh, extract the themes and the sentiment 
so that we can see immediately that people may be talking about the billing process or they're talking about the onboarding process and you can do this um, systematically and then based on that you can also assign these cases or create these cases and assign them systematically things like engagements so this will speak more to your marketing and your marketing team but your marketing team are putting out communications all the time they are they are upselling cross-selling uh, general brand awareness and your customer base are either responding or not responding to those things uh, all the time and that activity or lack of activity might be important enough that you would actually want to create a case and create visibility about that right i think i've got a couple more so in terms of systematic uh, let's look at number four there. So customer journeys. What do we mean by that? And we're not we're not going to talk too much about uh, customer journey management today. But a customer journey is really a sequence of touch points. So as customers are navigating your touch points and going from your branch to your call center to your mobile app, there may be certain sequ sequences which are more important than others. So for instance, you may see that as a customer is trying to achieve their goal, they have to call the call center three times uh, in order to achieve that, or even more than that that sequence should be able to trigger a rule um, which then triggers a case so that someone is informed that a customer is stuck in a loop they're not progressing there's rec recursive behavior going on and uh, we create visibility about that and finally third-party solutions you've obviously got your call center applications you've got other applications within the business and uh, you might want to use certain scenarios on those in order to ensure that cases are created so what we've been uh, talking about now is we've been talking about systematic case creation but obviously they're on the right hand side as well we would recommend that you're able to create cases manually as well because at some point the phone is going to ring or a fax is going to arrive um, if that's even still possible and someone might have something to say which is important and you need to elevate the importance of that thing and uh, create visibility within the business and so you really need uh, some mechanism to create cases manually as well Right, we're gonna uh, jump to number two, which is exploring context. So context is king. Uh, your customer arrives with very, very certain context. And um, what we really want is we want a view of the customer that gives us a sense of uh, that context so that we can, uh, so that the consultant within the business, business can really approach them appropriately. So every customer has a unique, a unique context and I mean, we would suggest that there are at least the following categories when it comes to customer context. And we would hope that you would have visibility of these uh, these particular things when you approach them. So a single view of the customer, number one, the high level details that you would expect to see of a customer. So it would be largely their, their preferences, their contact information. Um, it's very high level information. It gets, it gets a little bit more, it gets a little deeper as we get into number two and onwards. So for instance, understanding their case history, we now have a fresh case for this customer for a new scenario. But what if there is um, a case history which, um, which speaks to this or another unresolved case, for instance? Uh, we actually want to see this kind of thing. Um, and this really wouldn't just be about cases, it would be about things like maybe they completed a survey last year or last month and they had very particular things to say. We'd want access to this information as well. So that's understanding the case history and interaction history. It's a historic view. Number three would be touch point activity. So which of your channels or touch points have the customers been touching recently? Have they been on your website? Have they been at your branch? If we can provide, it, if it's possible for the business to access a longitudinal view of the path that the customer has been taking in order to achieve particular things, and it'll give you a sense of where they are operating and what's important to them. And ultimately, sentiment and themes. So um, I'll take you back to the story of Sophie in a little bit, our, our business traveler. Uh, but she had very particular things that were important to her. We might want a view of a customer that says, actually, this customer um, is very concerned about our product range or is very concerned about convenience. And uh, we'd want to see her sentiments uh, curve over a period of time to understand where she is and what's important to her. And we do that through text analytics in order to extract these, um, these important themes. A few things that we would suggest about this context of the customer is that it really should be available almost anywhere within your platform. So anywhere that the customer's name pops up, basically, um, and that could be on a case, it could be on a survey response, 
we want to be able to hyperlink through to that uh, that customer pro that customer profile so that we can see their inter their interaction history and all the other things that I've just spoken about. Um, during the course of uh, a, a relationship between a customer and a business, there are obviously quite a few documents that get exchanged, and we would want a lot of those documents to be grouped around the customer profile so that we can see uh, what has been shared by whom, uh, what is important, and uh, there's always, you know, there's a record of exactly what has happened. And then, I mean, just an obvious point there at the bottom is that wherever there's a gap and we need to actually reach out, we need to have the ability to reach out to that customer in real time, usually through, the, through something like an email or a text message and just uh, engage them, um, ask for certain information that we're missing, but make sure that that, that thread of communication is always bundled around the view of the customer as well. So that next week, when something else pops up, um, an agent on that side would be able to see that a particular conversation was had this week um, and nothing is lost. Right, let's jump to number three, driving recovery. Many servicing issues can be relatively simple to resolve, but our processes and mechanisms really need to be able to accommodate quite complex customer scenarios as well. Many of you will be in large businesses where you have uh, a long list of products and services, as well as quite complex uh, customer view scenarios because customers are sometimes split across different systems or the view of the customer. And this is why we need a, a degree of, of intelligent functionality in order to address all of this. So when it comes to the actual cases and the resolving of the cases and making sure that cases uh, show progress and are resolved, uh, we differentiate between uh, two, different, two different roles. And the two different roles are owners and assignees. And what happens is that uh, assignees really have to do the work on the case. They need to gather the information, they need to contact the customer, and they need, really need to make sure that the case is closed and that the customer is satisfied with the resolution. The owners are those who are responsible for seeing that the assignees are really doing what they're meant to be doing within an SLA period. Now, why this is important is, is because, um, as you would know, we sometimes see uh, indiscriminate passing around of cases between agents. Uh, but this will ensure that owners are making sure that the assignees are doing the work that they have to do and that it's not reaching an SLA period. When it does reach an SLA period, then what happens is there'll be an escalation. And typically what would happen then is a supervisor would be included um, and there would be greater visibility and interest in that particular thing. Um, and that speaks to the escalation. So that would escalate and include a supervisor. And then what's also important is there on the right is understanding failure and recovery. So there is all this activity within in your business. There is the feedback arriving, there are the cases that are being created, and then there is the service recovery activity which is happening. And uh, you would want a view of how well you are doing within the business. So we would suggest some of the following things. So you would likely want the following kinds of views, uh, a root cause analysis. So what are the reasons for service failure? Why are we even getting tickets out there in the world? <laughs> what are these things that are going wrong? Service failure hotspots. So where in the business is this happening? Uh, by division, by channel, by product perhaps. Uh, recovery and escalation times per service area. So who, uh, which team is actually recovering the fastest or which ones are escalating because they're reaching their SLA periods. And then your backlog management, which is really a view of your queue by area, your service and queue by area. So that's driving recovery. So let's talk about being human. So customers need to be assured more than anything else that they have been understood. Um, and our tools and approaches really need to ensure that this is possible and that the, we are empowering our consultants to deliver empathy at scale, which is something that we talk about quite a lot. And delivering empathy at scale is something that is possible when you have a reliable view of the customer and that view of the customer is accessible to your rules engine so that you can really engage at scale appropriately. So let's talk about a few things. So keeping customers updated. Silence is the thing that really creates anxiety. So customers need to be personally updated and sometimes this is through personal contact with, a, uh, with an individual. But sometimes it, it is also a uh, 
a brand powered engagement or a automated engagement. So there are two sides of this. There is the personal engagement where an agent is going to reach out and uh, contact the customer. But then we also need to be able to do triggered engagements. So this would be a notification. It would be something informing the customer that something has progressed or another, another consultant has been assigned. And uh, in all these cases, we need to be able to leverage the context. And this speaks back to the single view of the customer. Um, everything that we have learned about the customer in our, in our relationship with them, which is their context, needs to be available so that we can systematically engage them appropriately. In uh, multi-brand environments, and uh, you know, I think of, for instance, uh, the retailers or the insurers, where there is often a master brand and then sub-brands, we need to be able to talk to the customer as the brand that they are familiar with, not some unknown entity um, or uh, you know, a, a, a master brand, but rather the one that they have engaged with, the one that they have contracted with. And this helps with familiarity and make, helps them to feel at ease and that the people that they know are actually dealing with their particular situation. And then once we have actually resolved this thing, um, it's important that we gather some feedback. So how did we do? <clears throat> we believe that it was resolved, but was it really resolved? What would the customer say? So we fixed this thing and, and what we would do now is we would suggest, let's reach out and gather some post recovery feedback. It's an excellent opportunity to understand how, uh, how the customer's experience has per perhaps, uh, hopefully, affected their perception and uh, affected their customer satisfaction and their customer loyalty even. And that's really just um, a, a thread to the, what I started the presentation with, which is about the service recovery paradox. And number five, ensuring efficiency. These are some of the things that we would suggest in order to make sure that your consultants are suitably empowered to, um, to make sure that empathy can be delivered uh, to, at, at scale. When you are dealing with large volumes um, and when service recovery and driving resolution is important, then it's really about processes and productivity tools. So understanding of responsibilities. Consultants, your consultants who are at the front line should never um, be confused about which cases they are responsible for and which ones they're working on. They would need a view, they would need a, a dashboard which provides them with a, with a view of what they're responsible for, not for what everyone is responsible for. And they'd need a, a series of quick filters in order to help them to manage their time, see what's important in the next hour, what's important today, what's going to be important tomorrow, so that they can manage their time and really just work through the cases um, systematically. Um, and this speaks a, a bit to user-defined views, um, bottom left there. Uh, so as a user, I would want an ability to create views which help me to manage my time. And this might be, show me all the cases that are going to reach an SLA period today. Um, show me those which have to do with a particular type of the, uh, part of the business or type of customer. And be able to really return to those views almost like a, a a saved view or a saved filter so that I don't need to go through all the filters all the time in order to, to look for particular things. I want to be able to tag uh, certain certain cases so maybe say well I'm going to tag this uh, under a particular category which is like a label so that I can return to it or draw up anything that, uh, that is within that label at a later stage, something that I may want to look at later. And I also want to autofill when it comes to um, case information. So. I think that there would probably in most businesses uh, be situations where there would be a large number of cases or a high volume of cases that are rec recurring scenarios. And there's no point in typing out the same details for all of them. I'd want to autofill with some basic information and then personalize. And that's the kind of thing that I'd want to do as an agent. And then your business has fields or attributes which are important to your business and wouldn't be important to other businesses. Um, we would want to have uh, the ability to capture those at a, at a case level, and then we'd want to be able to report on them. And uh, I mean, this is going to be important. We can't uh, have a system which has a set list of attributes which we want to capture, but they need to be business specific so that they work for your business. And these are some of the things that we would suggest um, in, in terms of ensuring efficiency. I'm going to return now to our scenario of, uh, of Sophie, our business traveler. 
um, and you'll remember the high level story. The high level story was that um, she was informed by, S by a text message that her flight was cancelled. Let's say that her flight was going to be the next day. And um, she was then, what happened then, sorry, was that actually a ticket was created. So you, you'll remember the high level scenario and I'm just going to go into a little bit more depth now to show you how this effective scenario could have played out. A ticket was created, that's an image for a ticket over there, and it was assigned to a particular consultant. Now there was some logic that sat behind that. Um, based on the single view of the customer, um, the platform was relatively certain that, that Sophie was in fact a business traveler and was there, therefore assigned to a particular consultant who deals with business travelers. What he did was uh, the consultant then looked at the single view of the customer in order to look at her interaction history, the flights that she has uh, that she had taken in the past, the way that she had interacted, surveys that she had completed in the past, and this uh, this allowed him to understand exactly what her history was. He was able to see that um, the customer was generally flying down for a 24-hour period, uh, flying down in the evening, uh, spending the day there presumably for a single meeting or for a couple of meetings, and was then flying back thus creating some certainty around the fact that uh, Sophie was in fact a business traveler. And then he also had a look at her sentiment and some of her themes that had popped out as being things that were important to her. What he saw was that um, themes of importance were things like convenience, uh, things like timeliness, uh, and, uh, and things like that, which then was able to really help him to offer a very particular thing. Knowing that she was going down for a meeting, he ensured that she received a ticket for a flight on exactly the same day so that she wouldn't uh, she wouldn't miss miss her meeting. Not everyone presumably received exactly the same kind of compensation or the same kind of service recovery. And then because uh, we now know that convenience uh, is very important to the customer, he was also able to offer her an airport shuttle on the other side. So as you can see, unlike the when I first introduced the storyline, which may have seemed a little bit random, uh, you can now see that there was some reasoning and some logic that went behind uh, what was going on, and she was offered very particular things, and the service recovery was quite specific to her because of the information that was made available. Once that was done, uh, Sophie then received a, a survey to ask her how the process had gone, what was the service recovery like, how do you feel about it, do you believe that we have in fact recovered, and um, her information, her responses to that then went directly into online dashboards uh, at, an, you know, at an individual level, but obviously results were aggregated and we were able to see exactly um, in real time how it was that we recovered and whether or not we did that well. So as you can see, a little bit more color behind the, behind the story. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna ask you guys to get involved and I am going to launch a poll quickly in order to get your response on something particular. So if you'll give me a moment so that I can find my poll here. And I'm hoping that you are seeing it in the next couple of seconds. So the poll is the following. The question is, which of the following is the largest barrier to excellent service recovery in your organization? The first option is organizational indifference. Number two is insufficient voice of the customer. So in other words, we're really just not listening at all um, or enough. Number three is overly complex customer experiences. So our customer experiences are very complex. There are lots of touch points, there are lots of channels, and it's difficult to, to actually make sense of all of that. Number four, difficulty in unifying customer information. So our customer information may be spread across different systems. And number five, difficult systems and methods. I'm gonna give you guys um, 30 seconds in order to participate in that, please. And then uh, once you have participated, I will tell you what the results are. And uh, we'll move on. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much for the responses. Um, very interestingly, it's uh, two thirds of you have responded uh, to the question. So thank you very much for doing that. And it is a 50-50 split. Half of you are saying difficulty unifying customer information, which was option number four. And the other half of you are saying option five, which is difficult systems and methods. Thank you very much for participating in that. I am now going to hand over to Margot who's gonna take us through a solution demonstration. Over to you, Margo, when you're ready. Brilliant, thank you, Anthony, uh, for that, uh, that very good outline in terms of best practice. Um, service recovery is certainly an area that 
uh, is so important but can be um, can be very complex to get right in in, in large organizations. So it's actually a really interesting um, and important uh, discipline service recovery. So and we often think about the goals um, of service recovery being to reduce formal complaints. And we know that uh, that formal complaints are costing our businesses um, a lot. And as such, service recovery is getting a lot more tension at uh, executive and board levels. And I'm definitely starting to see more and more um, of the business case for customer experience being created around reducing formal complaints. And in fact, many businesses um, eliminating formal complaints is becoming a higher priority than improving things like customer satisfaction or NPS, um, because these metrics are really outputs of great customer journeys where there is um, where there are fewer service failures. So this is the Incuba uh, platform, and I'm starting with it with the case management dashboard, which really brings together. Um, all the customer complaints and compliments from different sources and provide this centralized view of service recovery performance and right down to an individual um, individual level. Uh, and it really provides us a way to monitor um, customer cases uh, centrally, um, how we're doing at service recovery, but also across the entire business, um, and especially for large organizations where you might have thousands of employees and multiple brands, um, you could get a view of, uh, of of the service recovery performance at any of those kind of of any of those kind of levels. So this is um, a view of our journey analytics for a credit card application pro process, and Anthony touched on this briefly um, a little bit earlier, but I want to mention um, it because it really is in Cuba's unique approach to customer. Uh, experience and that being customer journey management. Um, and service recovery in the context of, of customer journey, of, of the customer journey, is really about thinking about um, cases or exceptions that customers experience um, in their journeys with us when they are trying to achieve specific goals. For example, applying for a credit card or buying an insurance product. And the journey path, um, or the path or journey that customers um, take really gives us that critical context um, in the recovery process. Um, and at each of these points in the journey, customers can get stuck, um, and they can get stuck on a number of different channels. For example, they could be uh, interacting with you online or from the contact center or in the stores. And we often know when they get stuck because they tell us um, on things like social media or they might respond to a survey um, that we have we have sent to them. So what Incuba does is really capture all of these cases um, from all these different channels uh, in the context of that customer journey. So how do we do that? So one way we do that is we set up um, feedback channels, um, and we can really bring in uh, those channels from from any number of sources that we've mentioned. So we've got things like email, Facebook, SMS, Twitter, um, your voice of the customer program, um, as well as a number of different integrations that we can uh, create with your existing systems, uh, line of business systems and data sources to really create that centralized uh, view of, of, all customer, of all customer experience. Um, so we would do that over here and we'd be able to create, um, create different channels um, for, each of those, for each of those channels. And what happens is that all the customer, customer data or, or feedback flows through into the platform in real time, um, as you can see in this home feed over here. And all of this is passed through the Incuba text analytics engine to provide uh, important themes and sentiment, um, which gives us that context um, to support in the, the, the service recovery process. Um, and we could create, uh, at this point, specific uh, audience-specific lists um, to give visibility of inbound customer feedback to different people in, in, in the organization. But when it comes to uh, service recovery, we really next, the next thing we need to really think about is what constitutes a negative customer experience and what are the rules that we need to create a specific case on. So we have um, th th this, um, this tremendous amount of 
uh, flexibility and extensibility in terms of um, the types of rules that we can use. I'm not going to go through all the technicalities, but it's very easy to set up um, different uh, different lists or different rules at a quite granular level based on all kinds of things. For example, um, we can have things like sentiment rules, which would be very useful a lot on social media and, and unstructured text. Um, and we can also have rules that we would uh, be able to build on specific customer questions and any other kind of data we could um, create uh, uh, any number of combinations of different rules, which would then give us a flexibility to turn a piece of feedback into, um, into a particular case. What we can also do is define who's re who is responsible for specific service recovery scenarios so that we can scale and automate um, the, the, the service recovery process and we can do that um, through, through these, these rule based, um, these types of rules. So as customer feedback is captured across the channels, these rules are automatically applied, which determines what becomes the case, um, which could be a complaint or could be a positive um, compliment, for example, um, as well. And the customer cases uh, then land over here for, for action. Importantly, um, as a case is created, an automated notification is sent to the person responsible for recovery or acting on it. And um, each user, when they come through here, would be able to see the items um, specific to themselves. And we can also set up permission to enable um, people to see the other items or cases within their particular team or across uh, all, all items and visibility. Um, and then as a case management user, I might navigate through to my bookmarked items. Um, over here, and you can see we've got a couple of um, example cases here, which have come from different channels. This is a, a, a case that's from an email source, from a survey source, a Facebook, and this is a manually created case, which um, would be able to be created for example from the top right um, hand uh, corner over there. So if we look at this case over here that's um, come from Charlotte, um, we might want to first have a look at um, the survey and the feedback that she has um, com completed. And we can see that she's, from the feedback and sentiment, that she's had a pretty poor experience um, with like, the claims process. On the right hand side here, I can also pick up um, important context about um, her things like her policy number and her particular claim and what, what and what was that about. So it's starting to build up um, a, a really good view in terms of um, what Charlotte was all about. I can also navigate through to um, the Incubus single view of a customer and I can see a whole lot of information around Charlotte. So I can see her contact information to make contact with her. But I've also got all of this context and all of this information about Charlotte um, and, and his attributes. Um, in addition to that, we can look at um, the interaction history. And these are all the interactions uh, that we've had with Charlotte um, over time, which, um, so we can see if this is the first complaint or if there's been other complaints. Uh, we also get a full view of um, all the activity around all the engagement with, with Charlotte. Um, and that can tell us if somebody else um, is maybe dealing with an existing case for Charlotte, so that we can really give her a, um, a, 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 a very single um, experience with us. We also have um, a sentiment view, which uh, gives us a really good sense of um, how Charlotte feels or her satisfaction with different experiences. And we can see that theme coming through here again around her dissatisfaction with the speed of the claims um, process there. So with all of this context, we can then start a conversation with Charlotte. And this might be, um, or usually maybe a call directly to Charlotte, but it could also be an email sent directly from the Incuba platform. And I'll talk a little bit about how we can also have um, some really um, smart automated emails uh, using things like machine learning um, to, to scale our responses. But say, for example, um, as an agent, I could interact directly with Charlotte. And what's very useful there is that by keeping the customer conversation all in one place, we can easily manage handoffs um, and ensure that uh, Charlotte has had a consistent 
and coordinated service recovery uh, experience with us. So we come back to our, our cases over here, um, to our case details. Um, I can then really start to capture the conversation notes that I've had with Charlotte um, about her case. Um, but I can also start to share this case or share actions related to this case with other people um, in the business, uh, for example, a claims assessor. Finally, once uh, this, this particular experience has been resolved, um, I can capture the outcome and close off um, the case. And then I could move on to the, um, on to the next case that is assigned to me um, or from my case dashboard, which makes it really, really easy and, and efficient for, for, for users to, to navigate and use. I'll talk a little bit about escalations and SLAs as well. Um, and to make really sure that no cases fall through the cracks, we can set up these SLAs and escalation rules where cases that um, aren't actioned, um, so the where, where cases aren't actioned within a certain time limit, um, and are, are escalated to a supervisor or a manager. So in that case, a notification would be sent to that supervisor or manager um, so that the case can be dealt with um, by somebody else. And this is really important um, in ensuring that cases don't become, um, ultimately become formal or formal complaints. Uh, Anthony mentioned a little bit around the two versions of uh, the Incuba case management. So we've got a standard version as well as a pro version of Incuba in case management. So I'll touch on a couple of um, a couple of those of those features as well. So with with Incuba Pro, um, what we can do is completely customize the case attributes. Um, and the workflow, which is something that you might have been thinking of as we went through the, through the presentation and demo, which is often required for larger, more complex kind of uh, organizations. And we would do that um, over here. We could set up all the different case attributes. Um, um, and then it's by, by doing that, you can make it very specific to an area um, of your business. And this is how we do it over here. We can also um, use what we call autofills. Um, which is quite a nifty feature in that it allows us to create um, it allows us to create macros, um, which support us when we deal with when we're dealing with large volumes of cases, which could be specifically around a similar thing. Um, and there's a, a whole lot of different types of, of macros that we can create to be able to autofill um, and automate a lot of the case. Um, of the case resolution and the service recovery process, um, which is really powerful for, for driving efficiencies and, and scale. We can also set up um, uh, automated engagement um, based on any number of different rules. Um, these can all be set up from the Incuba platform. And um, we could also, part of that, we could also have um, a, um, a post case survey, um, and which is really like an, uh, it's really a powerful tool in terms of leveraging what Anthony is talking about around the service recovery paradox. Um, and to, you know, we, we know that customers who have had a negative experience, um, but that experience is effectively turned around, are more loyal than customers who have had a neutral experience. Um, and we can assess that through a post um, a post case a, a case survey, and we can set that up with a, with a number of different um, different rules. Uh, I'd like you just to zoom out again and think about what we are trying to achieve with effective service recovery. Um, you know, we ask these questions: Are we improving the customer experience um, through the service recovery efforts across, across the organisation? Uh, are we resolving customer issues effectively? Are we reducing or eliminating formal complaints? And what is the cost benefit to the business of doing that? And um, I'll come back to you just to wrap up around the, the case dashboard, which really provides this visibility and a way for us to manage uh, customer cases across multiple channels and have people in the across the organization resolving, um, re resolving customer issues in a very highly cost sort of coordinated and effective in effective way. So that, that really wraps up the demo part of, of the webinar. If you are keen to see more, please do reach out to me 
I'm based in Sydney and would love to meet up um, and take you through um, through this in more detail. So I will hand um, hand back to Anthony now. That was brilliant. Thank you so much, Margot. Um, well, wonderful storyline, wonderful context. Uh, it really helped us to, I suppose, visualize uh, uh, what it was that I was talking about quite theoretically. So, so thank you for that. Ladies and gents, I just want to take a quick moment to tell you about uh, that which I mentioned right up front, which is our paper, um, The Five Best Practices of Service Recovery. It's quite an in-depth paper and it is, uh, like I said, it has a lot more detail than what you are hearing today. So I really want you guys to grab this. If you, if you look at your little uh, webinar widget, there is a section there called Handouts. There's a single document in there and that's where you can go and download this. Um, of course, if you have any trouble to grab this uh, right now, in grabbing this right now, please reach out to us, uh, either myself or Margot, and uh, we'll make sure that you get it very quickly. But please, please go and grab that now. And there have been one or two questions. I'm just going to quickly check and see if there have perhaps been any fresh ones. But uh, yeah, Margot, let's let's wrap up with a couple of questions uh, that have come through in the Q&A. So thank you to those of you who have uh, sent something through. We're just going to address one or two of these questions now uh, before we close. Uh, the first one is uh, from Bradley. Bradley, thank you for this one. The question is, we're an insurer and our view of the customer is complex and often incomplete because of the variety of products and services that we have. So based upon this, what's the best way forward in terms of service recovery? Margot, do you want to have a go at that? Yeah, and I think that's a really good, a really good question. Um, and, and I think these are the challenges why um, it's so important, you know, really that drives why it's so important to have um, an effective service recovery system that you can scale uh, across the business. And uh, really why we have put so much thought into the, the, the best practices that are needed. And when we start to think about um, like what the Incubus platform does is that we are able to stitch together um, everything that we know about the customer. Um, and then, as I've showed you in the demo, is present that in a, in a very easy way for, um, for employees and people in the organization to understand that customer context, but also to, to empathize with them. So. Um, you know, we, we make it look quite easy, but it, and it really is um, set up to be able to hook into your existing systems and data sources to be able to to, to enable that. Great, thank you, Margot. Um, a second question, and I think we're going to land with this one, the second and final question. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for this question. We have a large customer base and it can get quite busy. Is it possible to actually anticipate service failure? Um, absolutely, but I, I, I believe that you can only start to anticipate service failure when you have got a system uh, that is in place, that is coordinated, that is well, well designed and well structured. And um, it's really one of the fundamentals with a journey approach to service recovery. Um, and when you start looking at the journey paths, you can definitely straight away start to see the common negative paths, which are definitely the most well trade um, and often more well trade than, 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 than the desired paths, um, desired paths are. So first of all, we can start seeing those, but as we get more data and we understand the, these paths, we there's huge advancements in terms of machine learning and not even very complex, but you can use quite simple models to start anticipating um, the service failures well ahead of time. And that's exactly the, the, the mind space and, and, and where we want to be in terms of um, in, in terms of service recovery. That's great. Thank you, Margot. Um, so we'd just like to thank you for your time today. Um, we've really we've really enjoyed this. Um, we appreciate you and we appreciate your time. And uh, this has been a lot of fun. So thank you very much. Uh, Margot, would you like to wrap up with us before we close? Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, and thank you, Anthony, for, for sharing those best practices. As mentioned, I would love to connect with, uh, with you. Um, I'm based in Sydney, so please do reach out um, if you'd like to have a coffee or chat or, or get some more information about uh, what we're doing with this. Thank you.